Great. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I have uh, alluded at uh, a number of points within the recent days to um, the many virtues that recommend um, uh, PMCMC technique. We have uh, been exploring um, uh, a number of different techniques uh, within the course of this um, of this event. Um, we've taken a look at uh, particle filtering, um, MCMC, and we're going to uh, we're going to go on to now discuss PMCMC, which combines the best features of both. You'll recall that the job of particle filtering was for a given fixed set of parameters. So, so that is, when I say fixed, I mean it's predetermined. It's contingent upon a, a certain, a certain uh, set of assumptions about parameter values, which we're denoting by MCMC traditions as theta. We're going to estimate the latent state of the system. And in fact, trajectories involving that latent state over time, that's x sub 1 to, to t. Given the data, which we write here again in MCMC tradition as, as y from 1 to t. Okay? Uh, now you noted here that we are sampling from whole trajectories um, in particle filtering in general, although many of the examples you've seen have used cross sectional data sampling. Um, this capacity to sample from trajectories, as we noted, confers much additional strength to take advantage of hindsight. So particle filtering was a technique um, that, that we've explored to a very large degree. Last night we heard about, particle, uh, about MCMC. In contrast to particle filtering, which takes not just the model, but the assumptions about static model parameters as, as a given, with MCMC, our goal is actually the converse. It's to estimate, to sample from the distributions associated with those parameters, theta, in light of the model evidence. So while we took those, those assumptions about per, of fixed parameter values, theta, as a constant, as a, as a given for particle filtering, with, part of, with MCMC, we're actually sampling from them. Okay. Um, and yet, we're not sampling from latent state. We're, we're kind of blind here to latent state. In fact, we're dealing, for MCMC, we're almost invariably dealing with a, and this is important, I haven't really emphasized it other than in passing, we're dealing with a deterministic system, a system which exhibits no stochastics. And um, therefore, we're not involved in estimating models of latent state because model latent state comes directly is directly implied by theta in the model. You run the model on its assumptions, including what's in theta, and you get some state. And you can run it twice, three times, you'll get the same state out of the model, exactly, the same trajectory. So reflected in the fact that MCMC is being used with, di with deterministic models, Really, there's no need to estimate latent state because the latent state of the system is totally determined by the model and the, and the theta. Um, what you're instead doing is trying to sample from theta. Okay? Um, what are the values of theta that are more likely? What are the values that are less likely but still possible that we want to take into account because maybe they lead to really bad consequences or what have you? Um, I had noted particle filtering can be used by optimizing theta. We won't go into that. See my previous remarks on that. But it's, it's a very viable approach. Particle MCMC takes these two traditions, particle filtering and MCMC, and puts them together in a very powerful way. Specifically, it gives us from MCMC the ability to sample from theta, from to, to try to understand the distribution over parameters, these fixed parameters that apply all through the simulation. But it also does so with the ability, with stochastic models, to sample from the latent state, to understand what in the world is going on in the latent state 
and adjust those understanding in light of evidence. So when we have these systems, we're not sure what state it's in because there's so many stochastics operating, et cetera. This provides us a way of, of estimating it. Or if we're uncertain about parameter values, this allows us to sample from this latent state in light of that uncertainty about parameter values. And I want to highlight the fact that, first of all, this sampling from theta and the latent state is contingent upon, is given the observed data. That same observed data we considered up here in both these two previous techniques. So given this data in the model, we are sampling jointly, meaning um, we are we're sampling both in as much as they relate to one another as well. So maybe we'll have certain thetas that imply certain things about the latent state. And we'll sample pairs of theta and latent state trajectories. Okay? So maybe the thetas which tend to be have certain values for certain parameters tend to have latent states that are kind of like this compared to other thetas that have very different um, latent states that are plausible. We'll sort sample jointly from these. So you can think of it as producing pairs of a theta and a complete trajectory of latent state of the system that we are simulating. Does that make sense? Okay, um, this is the, the province of PMCMC. Let's see how, let's see what PMCMC does at a little bit of a closer level. Okay, um, so we're going to switch to my PMCMC uh, slides here. So, recap again, it supports estimating joint distributions of parameters. That includes static parameters as the main focus but also evolving parameters by extension because those could be sampled by particle filtering anyway, and system state over time, trajectories of system state. Um, it's highly computationally expensive, and we'll get into this. It's actually a family of algorithms, MCMC, and I made reference to the fact there's some more sophisticated ones than I'm gonna be talking about today. It turns out that not only is MCMC a family of algorithms, but so is PMCMC. And the kind of go-to reference, it's kind of the Bible for PMCMC, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is this article, which in as much as it also contains commentaries on this article. So if you go and you find this article, this is a notoriously dense and, and um, rich, but also challenging article. Now, if anyone's interested in going through this, I have my notes on this article, my annotations, which I'm glad to share. Okay, um, I'm glad to just send them to people. It's a PDF with my markup on it, saying, oh, this really means this, or see this page for what they're talking about, or what have you. Um, it's in a journal of Royal Society B, um, one of the most prestigious uh, mathematical statistician journals, but it contains a whole series of commentaries by eminent statisticians on these approaches, okay? Including examples where they do well and not so well or what have you. So um, I, I strongly recommend being at least aware of this, um, uh, of this uh, article. And I am more than happy to share with you my annotations as well as my separate notes. I have extensive notes on PMCMC because it took me a while to wrap my hand, head fully around what was going on. And I'm hoping to spare you, gentle participants, the need to go through similar uh, challenges. Um, so, we are seeking to take the evidence we have from the world to sample jointly from parameters and latent state of this system. Um, and the basic situation is laid out here. And hopefully you will warm to it by recognizing the various pieces you already have seen before in different guises. So firstly, at the start, you're going to need to find a value for the parameters 
that will have associated with it a non-zero posterior value. So like MCMC, you may recall back in our MCMC slides, um, we, we went and we picked a value here for the initial, uh, some initial start of the chain in terms of what do we assume about parameter values. And this value, although I don't comment on it on this slide, this value has to have a non-zero posterior. And remember we computed in this context, the pure MCMC context, um, uh, posterior using this formula. This is based on Bayes' rule. We calculated something that was multiplication of this prior probability by the likelihood knowing from Bayes' rule that this product is proportional according to some constant, which basically we can conveniently ignore, um, it's proportional to the posterior value. Okay? So if we have a theta whose posterior is bigger than another theta, although we don't know actually the posterior except up to a constant, in other words, uh, maybe it's, it's two times bigger than this, uh, if, if, if we have uh, theta and a theta star, and theta star is a higher posterior than theta, then um, uh, this, uh, the product of this for theta star will be the bigger than the product of it for theta, because the, the posterior is just this times some constant, which is the same for both of those. So we calculate the posterior in this way in our MCMC algorithm. Do you remember that from yesterday up, up front here? Okay. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here back to PMCMC. Um, same basic deal, we'll find some initial, some initial guesses to the parameters. It's not at all privileged, it's not at all sort of um, uh, special. By, by tr just trying to find some that is a non-zero posterior value. And, and we'll evaluate the posterior in ways we'll talk about. Okay, and then we're going to run MCMC iterations. In our MCMC code, you may remember, we, we um, have iterations. Until some convergence criteria is satisfied, we'll keep on doing this dumb little thing, this, this little step, right? We will take the initial, our current state, and we'll add a perturbation to it to form some candidate and then we'll see if the candidate is, we'll test if the candidate is a good candidate, if we want to accept it or not, which is, involves the Monte Carlo, we're rolling uh, dice, so to speak, um, to determine whether we accept or reject it, right? Remember that from yesterday? We, we select candidates and we accept or reject, right? We're here on this, on this um, in this space, and we're at this current point, we either accept or reject the candidate, so we get a candidate by perturbing our current theta. We either accept or reject it. If we accept it, that becomes our new current space. We transition on the conceptual markup chain to a new place, theta star. If we reject it, we just reissue. We stay at the current place. We reissue theta. We just stay here. We just reissue theta out. So that was MCMC. And it's the basic same thing here, OK? We're going to. Uh, we talk about PMCMC having these MCMC iterations. Um, and those MCMC iterations basically are going to consider candidates theta star, which are just perturbed values of theta. We're doing exactly the same thing as an MCMC. We're taking our current theta, which it contains our assumptions about the parameters, and we're adding, for the simplest case, random walk to Metropolis Hastings, um, uh, we're just adding a per random perturbation to it to get a theta star. And then we're going to evaluate that candidate and either accept it or reject it. The difference, the key difference here is that in order to evaluate the candidate, we're going to need to perform particle filtering. Because we're going to want to assess the posterior for that candidate, and that will involve estimating the latent state. Um, uh, so, and sampling from the latent state to get the trajectory, to get a particular trajectory. 
And actually, in the process of evaluating this theta, in the process of performing particle filtering, we're, we're actually going to get an understanding, not just from the trajectory we sample, but from the weights across all particles and across all time steps in the particle filtering, that's going to give us a key value we need to evaluate the posterior. Okay. So it's actually, we will sample in our particle filtering that we perform for candidate theta star. We will sample a particular trajectory. But it turns out that the particle filtering will also be absolutely essential more broadly than that trajectory to estimate the posterior distribution for theta star. Okay? So there's an outer loop here that just does MCMC iterations. Just like we did with MCMC, we have a current point, we perturb it with, say, with the simplest algorithm with a random walk, we're gonna have a candidate, and we are going to accept and reject that candidate, okay, according to a posterior. But in order to evaluate the posterior, you have to perform a particle filter. Okay, so what's gonna happen? The particle filter is gonna be performed conditional, assuming that the parameters have this candidate value, okay? So the idea is we're testing the waters with this candidate value. We're testing things out. Maybe the parameters are this. And we're gonna, or, or, is this a candidate still? And in order to test how good a candidate it is, we need to calculate the posterior value for that. In order to calculate that, we have to perform particle filtering assuming that the parameters in the model during the particle filter were assumed the parameters in the model are as given by theta star to evaluate it, right? Um, and uh, so we're going to assume theta star as the parameter values. And, uh, and then we're going to go through the normal particle filtering process that we've come to know and hopefully love. Okay? So here we're going to get a bunch of observations and and we're going to have weight updates at the observations, but there's going to be a difference. Every observation and weight update is going to trigger a resampling of that. Okay? Dr. Lewis mentioned that actually is not truly essential, but that's how it's laid out for simplicity. And it makes the ancestry matrix particularly easy to accumulate because you, you, you need to accumulate for every observation, you need to keep track who is your mommy. Right. Okay. Um, the entire trajectory. Oh, so so we're going to basically perform particle. This is our this is our standard standard particle filtering. Uh, assuming these parameter values theta star, we're just going to perform particle filtering and at observations we're going to do the weight updates and resample, and then we're going to run all the particles to the next observation in the standard way, like for particle filtering, right? If, if I've just observed uh, at time t minus one, done the weight update, done the resampling, now I'm still at time t minus one. I, the resampling and the weight update don't change the time. And I'll run forward from t minus one to t, to just before the next observation. Just run the model forward for every particle, right? Remember this with particle filtering? Every particle at a complete version of model state, remember that? Do you remember that? Every particle has a complete understanding of model state at a given time. So imagine we're at time t minus one. We've just incorporated the latest observation, adjusted the weights, performed resampling. We have a population of particles, right? At time t minus one, they believe something about the world. The weight update didn't change their view of the world. It just changed how much we believe them <laughs> about the world, right? Um, the credibility we attach to them. The, the, the degree of confidence we have in our understanding. Those that have higher weight, we believe are more credible. Those with lower, less credible. In fact, the weight all get reset to, to equal values after resampling. But the basic deal is we have a population of particles that believe things about the world at time t minus one. And, and now, in order to get to time t, we just simulate them, them forward. Each particle runs the standard model equations, right? If this is an agent-based model or a speed event model, they're running those set of those set of rules going forward, just like you're running a discrete event model in Arena or running a running an agent-based model in Repast or any logic or what have you. 
They just run it forward, okay? To time t. To the time just before the next observation. And then we will have an observation occur, we'll say, what's the likelihood of observing this datum? And we'll up or lower, you know, we'll adjust their weight accordingly, right? Those that are more consistent with the observation will tend to have higher weights coming out of that. Those who are less consistent will have lower weights. And then we'll do another resampling. And that's time t. And now they'll run forward to time t plus 1. Remember this? This was our standard particle filtering. Nothing different. The one thing is, that in running the model, we'll be assuming parameters hold the value as given by theta star, this candidate. So it's kind of like we say, yes, ma'am, you know, we will run this particle filtering um, assuming these parameter values you've given to me as theta star, and we run it forward, right? And uh, it's, it's just the standard stuff. We're here, we're accumulating, we have to accumulate ancestry matrix. So every time we do a resampling, we record very carefully who was the mother of whom. So resampling, it leads to that, you know, some particles die out, some particles multiply, and each new particle on that list will have some mother that gave rise to it. Maybe it was they were the only child of that mother, or maybe there were 10 children of that mother. They have lots of siblings, but we need to record who their mother was. So at, at time after resampling, maybe particle I had part had mother who was particle J at, at just before resampling. Does that make sense? So we're keeping track of that ancestry information. Um, okay, and then we we do that to the end. It's just our normal it's our normal particle filter, and then at the end we. Before we perform resampling, mm, we have a final weight associated with all particles, in some way. And we just sample a particle, according to, we sample one particle according to that weight, with, with, with uh, chance of measuring according to that weight. You remember my example from yesterday, right? Where are those headphones when I need them? Um, remember that? You just sample from the weights, right? So I want to sample from these things according to their length, and the length is the weight. And I remember eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Remember that? Um, as long as I can uniformly sample, I can actually figure out, I could sample from things according to their length. Because all I have to do is pick a random, a random point uniformly between here and here, and using the sophisticated eeny, meeny, miny, moe algorithm. And then I can find the appropriate thing who's, I could pick the appropriate one. And it turns out that if I study it, the probability of picking each is according to their length. But I could do the same thing with weight. I just pick a value between zero and one, and I go to reach particle until I can't reach beyond a particle. In, in other words, I keep on accumulating the weight uh, of each particle I go by until it's, it's uh, larger than the value I, I um, obtained. Basically, that's the deal. Any computer science student should be able to do that. Um, uh, hopefully by the first year, if I get the algorithm. Um, so here we're going to pick a particle at the final time, and then we're going to trace its ancestry back and get its value that it had as of each, particular, each previous observation time point. That's what this one colon t is. In other words, I'm sampling whole trajectories. I'm not just sampling any old value as it was at time one, any old value at time two. I'm not sampling each of those separately. I sample one particle at the end, and I pick its ancestry. OK? Right? And it dated back to this early particle of great significance. It, it dated back to, you know, uh, at time one, Confuzo. Yeah. So when you say the end, you mean at the very end of our whole particle process? At the very end of all the particle filtering, the final time, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a set of particles that have survived, mm -hmm. right? Okay. A set of particles, and each of them is going to be associated with a weight that gets updated from the final observation. And instead of doing a resampling there, which would reset all the weights to the same thing, 
I'm going to draw from them according to their weight, to their final weight. Um, and that's going to give me one particle that I get out. I'm going to draw one particle. The one with the highest weight. No, not the one with the highest weight. I'm going to draw from it. it one with the highest weight will be deterministic. I'm going to draw from it randomly according to their weight. Just eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Right? So I'm going to... I'm going to pick it, and it's going to be random. I'm going, to, I'm going to pick one, but those who have weight, if you consider two particles, one with weight 2 and one with weight 1, okay, the weight's sum to 1, okay, point one, a point 0.2 and point 0.1, then the one with a weight of point 0.2 is going to be picked twice as, twice as likely to be picked as the one with weight point 0.1, right? That's what the any meaning money mode thing. So if I have... If I have this thing, which is longer, and I, if I have something that's half its length, let's say this roughly, well, it's like a third, but anyway, you get the point. Um, this thing is twice as likely, or three times as likely as this guy here, right, to be picked. That's what I want. Uh, but I'm picking one particle, one particle, because that particle implies a trajectory. And what this means, and this is a very important point that I actually emphasize in one of these slides coming up. Um, if I have that same particle filtering gets done again, I might pick a different particle for the given theta sovereign. I'm not always going to predict, pick the same particle, right? It's also reflects on the fact there's a lot of randomness in the resampling and so on that's gone on, right? Sometimes if I run a particle filtering algorithm, some things may die out that don't in other versions, right? Because of just the vagaries of we didn't happen to pick that particle. Does that make sense? Okay, so the idea here is I'm going to pick one particle at the final time according to its weight following the final observation, um, final observation after the weight update there, weight normalization. I'm going to pick that particle, and then I'm going to use that to find its mother, its grandmother, its great-grandmother, its great-great-great-grandmother, and the weights and the value of each of those. The value that they had for every state variable of the model at those previous times. So, you know, it's great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great and so on. Grandmother had a certain state vector. She believed as of time one this thing was the case of the model. There's going to be her daughter who believed this thing was the case at, at time two following the observation. Following the observation? Before the observation. Um, I, I'd have to think about that a moment. For, but um, we go back and we find what their belief was at their previous time, at all those previous times. Does that make sense? And that trajectory is sample, that is, is x sub 1 colon t for, for um, theta star, okay? Um, and then it turns out that, that so that, that's, that will be our sample latent state trajectory if we accept, so if we're going to accept theta star, we will be using that as our latent trajectory that we also accept. But to figure out if we're going to accept theta star, we have to figure out the posterior value. And it turns out that the posterior value for theta star is totally dictated by a simple formula involving the weights in particle filtering for every point in time that observations occur across all particles, not just the sampled one, not just the sampled one, not just the one whose trajectory sample across all. So when you perform this particle filtering, one of the things you get out of it, if I could be crude about it, one of the things you get out is this particular trajectory that you've picked based on the weight at the final time and its ancestors, right? But the other thing that you get out of it is you get for every point in every sort of point in time where there's an observation, you get out a a set of weights for every particle. And it turns out that those weights, 
for every particle at each point in time, if you crunch them together in a certain nice little formula, that gives you the posterior value for theta star. It's not just for the, the trajectory you've sampled. That's just an example trajectory. It will be an important example trajectory, but really we need to figure out the, the posterior for theta star. You may wonder, like, why are we figuring out a posterior for theta star? I thought I just wanted to sample this. Well, remember from MCMC? Do you remember from, from MCMC? Um, oh, 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 okay, sorry. Um, Okay, uh, do, 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 do. Um, for MCMC, um, you remember we needed to compute the posterior for the candidate and compare it with the posterior for the current value, right? Remember that? That was quite central to, to how MCMC worked. Um, I know it was late in the day yesterday, but um, the idea was we were computing, I'm, I'm flipping, different slides here and hope that it will stimulate a, a memory. Um, we, need to, we need to compute the posterior at the candidate value and compare it with the posterior at the current value. Because remember, with MCMC, at any one time we're at a certain point, theta, a certain set of parameter values that apply, and we pick a candidate through a perturbation, theta star, and then we need to evaluate its posterior. That's what P of X is, posterior, being sampled. Remember that? And we need to take its ratio of those. And that's why it doesn't matter if it's posterior times some constant, because in the ratio, the constant cancels out. So it doesn't matter. So it's P star over P that we're interested. How much better is P star in terms of us posterior value from P of theta? That's, that's what's down here. See this? Right, right down here at, the, at this? The bottom, so so this ratio, right? We're going to accept p theta if its posterior is higher. We're always going to go there. If p theta, sorry, sorry, p theta star. We're, we're going to go there from p theta. We're at p theta. We're going to go to p theta star if its posterior is higher or equal. But even if it's less, remember I argued yesterday if it was at this trough, we'll still go there a lot of time. Maybe this is point. 70% of this guy, and so 70% of the time we'll actually still go there if we pick that. So the point is, in order to figure out whether we're gonna go to, one of the, to a candidate point, we're evaluating the posterior of the candidate, we're comparing it to the posterior where we currently are by taking the ratio. Do you remember this? A Little bit? Long day yesterday. Um, So um, that's what we were doing at MCMC, do you remember that? We're doing exactly the same thing here in PMCMC. It's just that instead of being able to compute, instead of, instead of computing this to just calculate the posterior, we have to do something trickier. We have a, a more complex expression that we have to calculate. And that involves performing, whoa, performing, <laughs> So confused. Um, okay, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think so many, so many of these up. Okay, um, come on, back to uh, my PMCMC. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, sorry. Let me just stop the presentations uh, here. Okay. So here we need to compute the posterior for candidate value theta star, just like we did in MCMC. We need to compare the posterior at the candidate versus the posterior at the current point to figure out whether or not to accept it, right? I think I have that, uh, here it is. So, so here, we're trying to figure out the posterior at the candidate versus at our current point. And to figure that out, we're going to need to calculate that posterior compared to this posterior. This posterior we previously calculated, that's why we're at this place. So we just saved that away. But this one we have to calculate. In order to calculate it, the way in which we calculate it is that comes out of the particle filter. Okay? We actually, if we go through the particle filter and we keep track of the information, we can calculate this P of theta star comma x of what? Okay? Does that make sense? 
And then we either accept it or we don't. If we accept it, guess what we emit? We emit theta star. If we accept the candidate, theta star, um, the candidate uh, parameters will emit theta star and what's this x sub i colon t star? What is that? That's the value we sent, the trajectory we sampled. That was the particular trajectory we sampled. So if we accept this candidate point, we'll just emit the pair of these. Remember I told you before, that's the job of PMCMC, it's to emit pairs of these guys. So it kind of says, if you have this, you know, here's a sample from both, right? If you have this parameters, Obtaining this this is a, tra a trajectory which with those parameters obtained. So it turns out that the ability to calculate the posterior for theta star, this guy exactly here, in order to calculate him, you have to perform particle filtering, and you just use the weights from every time point and every particle. Hmm. You can calculate it and. That can determine the posterior, and then the ratio of the posteriors determines the probability of acceptance, and then you determine, do I accept? If I do accept, if I accept the candidate, I'll admit that together with the sample trajectory. If I did not accept it, I'll just, this says state in current place, sorry. Stay, stay in current place. Um, stay in current place. Better English word is remain. Um, remain in the current place. Um, and re emit the theta and the previously sampled latent state for theta. Um, so, in other words, if we don't accept this guy, if we do accept this guy, we'll emit theta star x sub 1 to t star, the thing that I sampled, given assuming theta star as the parameters. If I don't accept, I just re emit theta and the thing I previously sampled when I, I'm here, which is x sub. I to t, the, the, the trajectory of the system for, for theta. Um, that's how it works. This is PMCMC. And they're joined? Like they're joined. Okay. Yeah. Because you have the one particle, but yeah. then the theta posterior is all. So, so good question. Remember, great, great question. I like where you're going. Let's try to drive this home because it might not be. You're exactly right. You're asking a key question. Are they. Is it a joint distribution over them? Um, I'm going to give an analogy, and then I'm going to come back to this, OK? Um, let's suppose that I want to, I try to be fair in my classes, like how much I write on each side. <laughs> and, and here, I, I think I've done an OK job with this. Labby, can I? erase this um, 182 million years ago. Um, imagine if we had weekly time series. Wouldn't that be awesome? 182 million years? Um, okay. Uh, I, I won't go back. Um, okay, suppose we have two random variables, um, A and, 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 and B, okay. Um, um, if if I want to sample if I want to sample to uh, from them uh, not not jointly but a sample from their marginal distribution I can just sample from A I'll get a whole swack of samples maybe millions of them or whatever and I can construct you know empirical distribution of those sort of a, a histogram you know of those and I could do the same for B. And those would be two marginal distributions, right? Like, it won't be joint, because it's not telling me when I sample A, you know, and at certain values, how does B differ? But this might, this would give a marginal distribution for each if I sample them independently. If I sample them together, maybe there's some sort of statistical, you know, relation between them, some sort of dependence, uh, I could sample pairs of them, right? I'll write it this way. Some particular value of A, some particular value of B um, that kind of goes along with it. 
This is a sub 2 and b sub 2, a sub 3 and b sub 3, etc. If I plotted these out, I could plot out the marginals. I could just plot out the distribution implied by the a's, right? I could plot out the distribution implied by the b's, right? But I could also plot out, using this information of a bunch of pairs, I could actually create, and, and I apologize, you'll see why I didn't go into art, um, but you know, I, I, could, I could draw out here, this is A, and this is along this axis, and this is B along that axis. Um, I could draw out actually from this sort of the distribution the, the, the 3D distribution here of how they relate to one another. Maybe there's a high dependence, so when A is high, B is high, or A is low, B is low. So maybe it's kind of a diagonal along this. And, and by plotting out with the pairs, I'd have enough information to do so. If I, uh, because collectively, if I plot out those pairs as kind of points in along A and points along B, plot each one out and accumulate, the number of things that fall in each bin here, each little bucket, um, I could plot out an empirical histogram for that. And that would give me an understanding of how they co-vary. It's not merely marginal. And so it is here where we're outputting pairs of a particular value of theta. Like theta has 0.2 and you know the first element of theta C is 0.21 and the second element of theta is 0.34 for you know p or something like that, and that's a, it's a pair between that those values and the x's which are these these this latent trajectory which applies when this was the case when we assumed this value for for the parameters what was the case, and by plotting these out together just like by joining these together, we get a joint, we can induce a joint distribution. We know what one goes with what one. That's the advantage of this, right? Compared to just having a whole swack of, if I sampled these independently, and I had X, A1, A2, A3, A4, um, and over here I had B1, B2, B3, B4, and so on. And you know they don't want me to write on the walls, but you, you can get the, the, the idea that goes on. Um, that this doesn't give me if I sample from them separately, it doesn't give me the information to draw a joint plot, right? Because I don't know which of these goes with which other. Here, if they're in pairs, I know which goes with which other. And so it is here. I know which of these thetas goes with which. The theta. Remember, this is a very particular theta. It's like a particular value for this parameter, a particular value for that parameter, and x is like a particular trajectory. It involves all the states at successive times here, but for the particular case where we assumed these values as given in that specific theta vector, like like this 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 parameter had this particular value, that parameter had that particular value. So it is. By joining these together and issuing these pairs, it's a, it allows us to construct this sort of joint distribution. Is that helpful? Yeah, I think I'm just confused yeah. um, by the, the weights across successive observations for all trajectories. Oh, okay. So this, this guy here. Yeah. Great question. So, great question. Okay, thank you. Um, And this is one of the things that's a little bit subtle about this. Okay, so what x is, this x quantity, that's just one trajectory we sampled. Mm -hmm. And we only sampled that according to the final weight at the final time associated with the particles at that time. Okay, we had a bunch of particles following the final observation, no resampling being done, and we pick from them according pick one according to its weight, and we just tra trace down its ancestors, and we have information about their values and, and pick them, okay? That, that's what x, the, the sample value of x is. This weights across successive observations. That information is not returned. It's not anything to do with this x. 
It's not, it's not anywhere tied up with this X. These weights across successive observations is purely used to calculate the value of, to calculate P of this thing. That's the value of the posterior for this candidate value and the candidate return thing. It's that there. And that depends on weights across successive observations over all time, over all particles. But that's just used to determine this value and then we throw it away. We, we're not sampling from that at all. We're not sampling from that at all. All we're sampling, the only thing we sampled is one trajectory which is beholden to, which was assuming theta star as the parameter values. This, it just turns out as a matter of necessity, we have to compute the posterior distribution. We have to have a particular value for it because we got to figure out the ratio of this to this, posterior wise. And to do that, you, you need, mathematically, you need to calculate it using a broader set of information from the particle filter. But that has nothing to do with this sample, nothing directly to do with this sample trajectory. The sample trajectory is just one trajectory sample based on the weights and the final time. It does not in any way directly relate to the, depend on the weights of previous times. It just uses the ancestry matrix to say who is my mother, who is my grandmother, et cetera. Um, but th determining this parameter value does require this other information accumulated particle filtering so I can determine what is this posterior value. It's like 0.34 is the value of the posterior at this point, or 0.22. Um, and so I can compare it with this one to figure out do I accept or reject. That's what exam that's what requires oh, that's what requires this guy here. Okay. And it, it it's not the sample thing. The sample trajectory is separate from this. It doesn't require these weights to be to be processed at that time and we're not returning those weights. We're just returning one trajectory. Is that at all helpful? Mm -hmm. And those pairs are like yeah. points in time. Oh, uh, good question. These theta, great question. I'm so grateful for this. This is awesome. These thetas apply across any any time. It's just like the value of the, you know, the the value of the contact rate to assume without changing it over time. Like Chayenne's contact rate actually evolved in time, but here we could assume one that's fixed for all time, or it's like the birth rate. It applies for the entire time of the model. Or the, you know, the uh, transmission rate that's assumed applies for entire time. So the idea is that um, theta doesn't really have a time associated with it. That's why it's not subscripted by time, because it applies for all times. This guy here, x, that's the value of every state variable in the model for successive time points, successive observation time points. So it's what was the state, what was the, I'm sorry. It's true, but it's for the particular sample trajectory. So we sample one particle and its ancestry. And it believes something at the final time. That particle we sample believes something at the final time. It believes this is the case in the world. Remember, as we said before, each particle particle filtering, it has a belief about, about this state, like the number of people in this state and that state and that state, or these, param these dynamic parameter values. It has a particular belief in the world. That's the final kind of column of this. Um, the previous column is its mother's belief when, at that time. Previous one from that is her, her mother's belief. And, and so this is a set of values of sort of state, the state associated with the various uh, 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 particles at different points in time, observation points from time one to time t. So you can think of this as a matrix where, where um, each row each row of that matrix corresponds to a particular element of, of this um, 
of the, the, the state vector associated with each uh, particle. And uh, each column is for a different time. So this is time one, time two, time three, time four, time five, da 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 da. And, uh, and then we have time t. This is the final time. This is the particle that actually got sampled based on its weight. It had some belief about the world at it time with respect to this first thing, some belief with respect to this variable with respect to uh, uh, what was going on at time t, some belief with respect to, to this guy here about what was going on at time t. This is what its mother believed, its previous one, this is its grandmother, this is its great-grandmother. At their successive times, this is what they believed was the case about the world. And again, this is for a particle filter which has been running with, uh, because we've run this with, with assuming theta star, the candidate values those parameters as the parameters obtained. This is specific when we are running this with theta star. This was our sample trajectory. And, and this is a tra trajectory. It may not look like a trajectory, but it is because it's, it's characterizing the values that obtained for those particles in the trajectory. Like this is the sample particle at time t, this is the one at time, uh, the time five, time four, time four. This is its successive ancestors further and further back in time. Does that make sense? That's, are people feeling a little bit? Okay, yeah, Simon. Um, so just back to that, um, that matrix. So yeah. if the particles don't change their belief, yeah. then one to T, would that be, that's not the same values in that? Say, say that again. In, in that matrix you just drew yeah. there. Because the particles don't change their belief, that matrix, does that, that doesn't change those values. Okay, great question, great question. By the way, I am just filled with gratitude for these questions because I feel, I feel what you're going through because I went through this for probably two years or something because I had no one else to unpack it for me like this. And I, 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 I went through and tried to come to terms with it. I had to write the code to do it. Um, so uh, I had that extra specificity, you know, the fierce urgency of the now, um, like to understand this. But I went through like struggling with what is this going for? Why do we have to do this? How do we compute the posterior? Well, how does it relate to the sample? Okay, particles do not change their belief about the world at any update of an observation. If, I have an update, if I'm a particle and I see a new observation about the world, it doesn't cause me to change my belief. That observation doesn't leave me to say, oh, I'm wrong. Oh, that's the way it is. I better increase the number of people that I've assumed are susceptible and downplay my belief in the number that are recovered. It doesn't work that way at all. At the time of an observation, before, just before the observation, I'm a particle, and I believe this is the case. At, at, let's suppose this is an observation at time, you know, t sub i, right? I believe this is the case before the observation. The observation comes in and I say, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, my likelihood is pretty low for that. Um, but what happens as a result? My weight gets downplayed, right? It's like the king says, you're not a very reliable minister, you know. Um, I, I'm gonna listen to you less, right? So my, my credibility has gone down. But my belief does not change. I'm not changing my belief at all because of that. It's just my credibility in the court goes down. Um, now, over time, now, so that's at time T sub I. Now that I'm done with that waiting process and any, any, um, any subsequent uh, resampling, now I'm going to run forward to the next time point, right? And over time, my dynamics are evolving because I'm, I'm just running the simulation, right? And, and or, or my progeny are going to, to run forward, right? So here, there's a resampling occurs. So you can think of that as my daughter is going to run forward, 
She's the next generation. She's the future. She's going to run forward to the next observation point. And as she runs forward, her dynamics are definitely going to change. The mosquito population will grow and fall. Empires will rise and fall. You know, um, uh, policies will be enacted and will have their effect. Um, you know, the, there'll be births and deaths occurring in the population. The number of susceptibles will be changing. Um, and so during my daughter's lifetime, lots will go on. So by the time that the second observation comes back, her state will be very different than mine. Not because she disagrees with me about what was going on at time one, but because now it's time two. And, you know, uh, uh, it's her, her understanding of the world at time two is different than my understanding was at time one, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Even if she were cloned from me, her belief springs from mine like Athena from Zeus's head in full of glory. And it's the same as her belief maybe at time one following resampling. She, I beget her in a perfect image of myself with the exact same belief about the world. She will be living to time two. Um, and and will undergo dynamics till then, which lead her to have evolved so that her belief as of time two is very different from mine. Her belief about the world situation at time two, just prior to that next observation, is very different from my belief at time one, just prior to that observation, or or vice versa after the observation. Does that make sense? So the the state numbers would would stay the same, but what they're getting compared to is evolving in the ground truth model? Uh, uh, no, the, the particles themselves, remember, so great questions, and I will just remind you, in the particle filter, the, just, just to remind you here, because I know this is, is, is challenging, between observations, all particles evolve according to standard model rules. So remember, those particles are running, they are running the rules of the model, be they agent-based rules or system dynamics equations or discrete event rules. They're just running forward between observations. It's standard model dynamics. Each particle is a solitude unto itself throughout that period. Um, uh, they run forward until the next observation. So there's dynamics inculcated in them and which plays out over time. So that by the time that my daughter um, uh, reaches the, the time of her observation, the observation that, that is going to occur, her belief about the world will be very different from mine was at time one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because particles are evolving between these times according to these rules. There's the dynamics of the underlying situation that the particles are capturing. Sure. Can I please ask a question about theta? I think I get the X thing going on oh. here, and I think I understand that now. Um, the candidate thetas, do we s start with some sort of distribution of theta where each particle gets its own special little theta and it sticks with that theta no. and it survives, or does no. theta evolve over time too? No. I'm confused. Neither. Um, theta, and this relates to, to the uh, question uh, question yeah. earlier. Yeah. Uh, is it Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks. My name is going <laughs> one ear up, the other was me. Um, sometimes they don't even go in the ear. Um, so, so um, theta, so, so the parameter assumptions are shared by all particles. These are fixed, theta represents fixed parameters. These are parameters that don't change over time by definition. Um, they hold for all particles. Remember that particle filtering Particle filtering, um, including this particle filter here, is is contingent, is 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 uh, presupposing a, um, a a certain set of parameter values. Okay, it's it's assuming a fixed 
a specific set of parameter values. It's a given yeah. that it's preserving. It. That set of parameter values doesn't change over time, nor is it specific to a particle. All particles share their understanding of the parameter values that apply. And those apply regardless of time. Okay. So how do we get a distribution at the end? How do we get a posterior distribution at the end of theta? Because I thought that was a thing here. Where we were. So remember that the thetas are shared right. between all the particles. What's different is the particle's belief about the state of the system because there are stochastics in the model. Those stochastics, as they operate, induce a distribution over particles, which mean that some particles believe different things about the world than others. If an observation comes in, that too is shared at a given time. The observation is shared, in other words, the, all the particles are operating off their same observation, right? They're assessing the likelihood of that observation occurring and using that to update their weights. That shifts the distribution towards highly weighted particles, right? And so, we're getting a evolving distribution of states across particles that shaped by the evolution of the particles due to stochastics on the one hand and encounters with data shared across all particles but where particles differ in the likelihood of or the degree to which they're consistent with the data particles that are more consistent are upweighted particles that are less consistent are downweighted and that ends up shaping the distribution to favor particles, the survival of the fittest. It favors particles that are more consistent with that data. Okay. And that, and that is the posterior distribution that's generated right. following an observation is a distribution that has been informed by the observation as to the underlying state of the model. All those particles share a, um, a, an understanding, a, a recognition, common assumptions about the parameters for this particular particle filter run. They are all assuming a certain value, say, for C, a certain value for birth rate, a certain value for, you know, the uh, the mean time someone spends in the latent period. All of them share that value, but there is a distribution across particles induced by the stochastics combined with the fact that we have these observations that shape that distribution uh, in a survival of the fittest of particles towards, towards emphasizing those that are more consistent with the data. The end result is at time t, we have a set of particles that have been honed in their belief about the world at time t by successive observations affecting them and their, their, their foremothers, their, their ancestors, over time, um, that have shaped that distribution, this posterior distribution following all the observations is, is savvy to those data as well as model dynamics. But that's all with respect to a certain theta. Does that make sense? All with but respect to shared parameter values. So do we get a posterior distribution of theta? Yes. Okay. With PMCMC. Okay. With PMCMC. Mm -hmm. Not with particle filtering. Particle filtering is all assuming oh, I'm a jumping, certain okay, value I'm jumping ahead, of theta. That's why I'm confusing myself. Par particle MCMC, right. by virtue of sampling, from from um, engaging in sampling associated with with um, with with this posterior is arriving at a joint distribution over particle uh, over over um, parameter values and 
trajectories of the system implied by those parameter values, or a trajectory of the system for each implied by those parameter values, that is how we get our distribution over theta. It is not given to us by particle filtering. No, on my apologies, that's what I thought. I thought I was asking about P and C and C versus. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so I just, it's, as far as I understand for P and C and C, so we first choose a set of parameters, theta, we choose a theta, and then we run particle filtering, and then toward the end of that first set of theta that we choose, or that first theta that we chose. The first. The first, first theta. theta. Yeah. First theta. Yeah. Then we have, we pick the, the x with, the random x, but with the most likely. And well, then we it's not most likely. We, we pick it randomly, but we're more likely to get one and that's, yeah. that's like, yeah. that and has then, a higher weight. And then we roll back, we roll back so that we can study more about the theta. That is where we update our that is where we calculate the posterior. Uh, posterior for yeah, the posterior involves, and and I know it's I know it's confusing, but the posterior, and it confused me too when I encountered this. I, um, the posterior calculating the posterior requires information from all time points and all particles, but that's just that's just how you calculate it. Um, it has nothing to do with what it, it doesn't directly have to do with what you sample. Uh, in terms of the trajectory. Yeah. yeah. Yeah? So you got it? I think I got it. Because that's, like for me, I think I get that because it's quite related to really the issue in geology as we see. Yeah. Is that we, 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 we kind of have a roughly a model how it work. So we take that model and we just take what we think and we go ahead with it yeah. until we get a better understanding that, because more evidence. Then right. we roll back right. and we update our model. That's so right. When we update our model, we actually update that data. That, that's that's what we do. beautiful. I <laughs> wish I could have said it as well. And I'm hoping this picks it up. Um, so so I, I love what you're saying, that to a certain degree, this re reflects scientific um, practice at a, at a very high level. In the sense, we go with some working hypothesis. That's our candidate. We see the consequences of that hypothesis over time, given the data that's available to us over time. We arrive at some preferred explanation of what happened over time successively, ex sub, sub, t, sub, sub 1 to t. This is kind of our best guess as to what happened over time. You know, Gondwana land was brushed up against this, and you know, Madagascar was floating in the Antarctic Ocean, or something like that, right? Um, and that is joint with, it's recognized that that's associated with your, kind of your, your theta is kind of your, your working, your, your going hypothesis about the, um, the, the parameters of the system and how fast crustal plates move versus oceanic crust and, or whatever, right? Um, and, then, and then you may calculate a posterior which reflects, well, how likely is it that this, this whole scheme holds, you know, with these parameter values? And you might use that to reject or accept that scheme for now as your going scheme. And then you might try a different variant of it in a different PhD thesis. Like someone tries a different variant and says, this one explains it even better. And, and any given theory is going to be associated with like a particular best guess as to where the continents were at those times. A particular best reconstruction of what was probably going on at different times in specific terms. But it's going, to be, it's going to be beholden to a certain understanding of the world that gave rise to it, sort of a, a best guess of parameter values. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well done. That's fantastic. Um, OK, so I know this is, is really challenging. Um, if, if you want to know what I, so, you know, if, if I say 
if you're feeling confused about this guy, for now just ignore this guy and just say, doing particle filtering allows us to compute the posterior value. Just don't worry about exactly how it does it. It, it, it turns out that doing the particle filtering has two basic benefits. It allows us to sample from this trajectory over time, which is one particular trajectory over time about the state of the model at different times. And two, it allows us to determine the posterior value at this candidate point, which basically turns out is it affects if we accept that or not. By the way, what happens if we don't accept this candidate point? Well, we, we then reissue theta and x sub 1 to t that we had previously sampled. This, and what that means is we went through all this work with a particle filter for naught, right? Like, well, it's not for naught. We, we did it, but we don't emit a sample that, that reflects that sampled, that sampled value, x star sub 1 to t, that one that was sampled contingent on x star. That's all thrown away, right? That can't, we say, oh, that, that didn't work out. You know. Um, it's not a very plausible alternative hypothesis. Therefore, we throw away the most likely reconstruction of the crustal configuration, right? For that. Um, yeah, so, so this is, is what's going on. You can see why you might say it's a bit of an expensive process because every MCMC iteration, we are performing a particle filter, right? Every MCMC iteration, we're performing a particle filter to draw this sample trajectory and determine the posterior. And then we either throw it away and keep the current place and reissue the existing sample and, and theta accompanying it under which it was uh, simulated, or we accept the new one and we use that. Does that make sense? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So. So I'm just gonna, I've been a while on that slide and I, I wanna you know, add, add uh, another thing. This is another way of, of, of posing it, okay? So you find the initial theta that gives a non-value, non-zero value for this posterior density. That actually requires doing that particle filter because to compute the posterior, to compute the posterior you gotta do particle filter, okay? Um, uh, and then, and, and actually you gotta, um, uh, okay, and then um, and then basically uh, we're going to um, uh, go in this loop of okay we have a theta and we're going to try to find a candidate that you know we're going to evaluate whether it's good or not so we're going to generate a, a candidate this is based here on our multivariate normal perturbation that's a that's this simple sim you might argue simplistic random walk metropolis system. It's simplistic, we do it, we're happy, um, we're getting good results, we can do a lot better, well, I want to speed it up a lot, and this is going to be a target, but basically it's viable, it's viable, as it is. It's, uh, it's a bit slow, but it's viable, it's viable. Um, perfectly happy with it, but we can, I want to do better because I want to advance how quickly we can learn. Um, okay, um, and then we, take the ratio of those two posteriors, right? Um, uh, and um, this, this is this whole thing about taking the posterior here versus the posterior there. And I write out in all its um, horrendous glory. You, know, you notice that it includes a prior and it includes this thing. And it turns out this thing, this first part of it, if you find buried in that Andrew and Doucette paper, um, uh, computing this thing requires particle filtering, okay? So particle filtering, again, is required to sample from these, these traje this trajectory, but it's also required to evaluate this. Um, and based on this ratio, you, you accept it or reject it based on this ratio with the same, it's the same basic thing you do in MCMC with that probability you accept it or reject it. Um, um, otherwise, uh, what, the, what the heck? That should be min. 
That should be men. Oh my gosh. Um, sorry. Um, oh my. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I. I this shall not stand. Um, uh, men. <laughs> Believe me, I, I'm not done yet. I have my tricks. Um, uh, format, shape, fill, uh, solid, fill, make it white. Okay? Boom. Um, um, men. Um, okay. Sorry, I, I, I need to nudge it a bit. Um, How's how's that? Ooh, okay. How's that? Um, just about good enough. Okay. Um, moving right along. Um, uh, so so here we have. Uh, so here we either accept or reject with this probability, right? Um, so if this probability is greater than one, we accept it for sure. Probability one. If this thing is less than one, we accept it with that probability. Um, otherwise, we re-emit this thing sampled in the previous iteration. Um, um, uh, I, I will note here that one thing that may be giving you pause is this is a stochastic model, and particle filtering is a process that has randomness as part of it. Which trajectory is sampled is a random one. It's not the most likely one. Even if it was the highest, prior, highest probability one, for different particle filterings with the same assumption about parameters, we might end up with um, different particles surviving to the end, right? So even that wouldn't be deterministic. So what I'm saying is trying the same candidate, like if you give the same candidate set of parameters, you can get different sample trajectories based on different times. That's, that's just the case. Yeah, it's the case. It's, it's, it's not... And the, like knowing theta star doesn't tell you with certainty what this sample trajectory will be. It influences its distribution. This is an important point, okay? It, it turns out to be um, helpful. Okay, um, uh, time is going on, but um, I've given you, you know, the overwhelmingly important things. There's some further detail, okay? Um, um, so, to sample from a trajectory, um, uh, basically you're using this particle filter, right? And you're drawing at the final time um, according to the weights following that final uh, update to, and reconstructing a trajectory. And you've got to be accumulating the ancestry information, okay? Um, uh, this thing. Um, is this thing that I said take requires accumulation of the weights. Um, Dr. Liu and I had a fun time with, with that. Um, uh, it takes a long time for certain things to get through my head. Um, she just sees some things like instantly. And this is the sort of thing she, she just like, yeah, I know what it is. And she can, she can write down some of these things. I'm like, oh my god, you know. Um, I don't know how you do that. but. Um, but she knew about this and said, oh, basically, you just use this formula. To, and this is like taking the average of the weights at each point in time and um, the weights computed in particle filter across all particles. And, and they show, they, they like show this in their paper that this is, is, is the case. To me, it, I, don't understand, I don't grok why that is. I grok most of the things in this. I don't fully grok why exactly this gives you this, but... Uh, but I believe Dr. Liu in the paper that, that it is the case. And I think they may prove it at some point um, in their collective work. Um, so this takes an average over all the particles of the weight at a certain period of time. If you want to do this, we have a code base which does it. Um, it took us a long time to, to get that all finalized and, and, and so on. And it works really well. Um, if people are interested, I'd suggest you not do it yourself. but. But um, glad to glad to share things here. Okay, um, sampling trajectories. I, I said it. Sample from the full full path of model state. I said this earlier during my remarks for the day. My retrospective. This is a lot different than sampling cross sectionally. It's sampling with the savviness of hindsight. Okay, um, we have to 
there's a bit of bookkeeping here. It's it's uncomplicated, uninspiring bookkeeping that's needed. We need these ancestry matrices. Each time resampling is done, we need to figure out who was the mother of whom, who begat whom. Right? We need to keep track of that information over time to go back and reconstruct the mother, the grandmother, etc. So we basically have to trace this through using uh, Xiao Yan's um, uh, uh, beautiful illustration. Um, uh, yep, so when you want to sample a trajectory, we sample a particle at the final time, um, or at the current time, you know, it's. Um, uh, uh, sample a trajectory at uh, the latest uh, time, okay, um, and we trace back ancestors. Um, maintaining this ancestral information requires considerable space. I will note that we have to maintain um, a certain amount of state information around uh, to, to reconstruct the, the value of that trajectory at each at each uh, time step, given that we don't know it until the end. Um, and I, I said these can allow you to sort of deduce stories uh, over time, okay? Um, okay, compared to other method, methods covered, PMCMC has a high computational cost. It's, it's expensive. We're doing these particle filters for every MCMC iteration. Let me be very clear, it's awesome. This technique, I'm, state, I'm, I'm staking most, a large fraction of our research group's efforts around this technique. I think it's great, it's super powerful, really insightful, but it's expensive, okay? Um, and let's go through why. Um, we have to perform a particle filter um, uh, on every MCMC iteration. Mm -hmm. We have to perform particle filter goes from time one to time t, every MCMC iteration. Each particle needs to run the simulation model, right? Each particle is running the simulation model forward. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you want to run multiple MCMC walkers at the same time, multiple chains at the same time, because you want to com compare their statistics to discover if it's converged. And there's some very nice ways of doing this. Um, so it's, it's important that it be implemented in an efficient fashion. We have this C code base that I wrote by hand and, um, and I'm glad I did and it uses stack allocation only and some other optimizations that, that really make it very efficient. But it still takes a while to run an MCMC chain. The good news here is there's many parallelizable elements. You can run distinct chains, distinct walkers on different machines and between observation points is a tremendous amount of parallelism. Oh, I should have said here, well, okay, I'll, I'll get back to this, but um, between observation points, you're gonna be able to, in principle, one could run particles on a separate GPU, for example, in parallel. They're totally independent of each other as they're going between time points, observation points. They're evolving independent of all the other particles. Each particle has a belief about the world that's evolving over time. As my daughter's particle between time one and time two is evolving over time with model dynamics. Okay, um, and it turns out there's parallelism at some fine-grained levels and and, and macro level because of this. Um, okay, this is a key point I wanted to now make. So it's important that MCMC be efficient. And I told you yesterday, I shared with you yesterday, that when it comes to MCMC, we have to, be, there's this Goldilocks principle that applies. We want, we want to have fairly high acceptance rates, but good exploration, or in general, we want good ex exploration of parameter space. And that means having reasonably high acceptance rates um, and recently high movement to get those acceptance rates. And it's the same thing here, okay? But I will say further that here we are computing this posterior for theta star, and this posterior depends on these weights in these particles that I kind of waved my hands at. This, um, 
uh, this, these formulas here. Um, uh, it depends on the weights at all time points, that's K here, across all particles, okay? Um, so, sorry, all time points, that's up here, and all particles, that's down here. Um, so, it turns out that it depends on that to calculate the posterior value. If you have few particles, if you don't have as many particles, it can throw off these statistics, and you can get a bum um, uh, estimate of your posterior value. You can get a bad estimate of your posterior value. Um, if you have lots of particles, my own, my own experience suggests lots of particles make this more reliable to compute, and therefore you get better acceptance from MCMC because it's not being thrown off by some silly inaccuracies in this. Just because we're trying to save time by having fewer particles, it ends up leading to lower acceptance rates. Um, because it spuriously, uh, spuriously says, ah, uh, this state of star is no good, when really it was just an accident. It had too few particles to reliably compute this probability. So we, uh, we basically um, uh, uh, have found that two things help a lot here for acceptance rates. One thing is broader likelihood functions. And if you remember my talk yesterday, that means, for example, if you're using negative binomial, using a small value of r, it'll spread it out. So we use values of r sometimes like 4, 5, instead of 40, because it actually makes it, it, it allows it to accept a larger fraction of, of, of the uh, proposals, and it still gets quite good results. The second thing is having more particles makes this more reliable to compute across all particles, and that means that it tends to accept more. And so you may think in penny-wise, pound-foolish way that if you restrict your particle count, it will be faster. But in fact, in practice, what I find happens is if you restrict the particle count, it leads to much lower acceptance rates and that leads to much lower, slower exploration of the space, which in turn means it's less, you have to run it for longer. So in short, you don't really get much efficiency out of low particle counts. So with MCMC, I like to do upper thousands like 8,000, 6,000, 10,000 particles at a time. And when you do that, you get quality results out you get quality estimates of this, and you can up your acceptance rates. So take it from an old man. Higher particles, fewer part, having fewer particles may seem, may seem um, like an economy that makes sense, but it turns out that you may be penny-wise pound foolish. Um, um, you, you may be shortchanging your acceptance rates, which slows you down in another way. Um, uh, so I think you need to throw many thousand particles at this. Um, and it may need to grow for larger models as well, I'm not sure. I, I think uh, quite, quite often maybe it does need to go even above 10,000 if you have a really complicated model. Um, okay, um, the truth is that MC, PMCMC requires some technical programming this is not something I suggest someone go out and use. I'm glad to share code bases, reflecting the fact they took us a couple of years to arrive at, and you know it it would be good to to, to get that acknowledged. But um, but fundamentally, you you don't want to to take this on as a small task to implement this. You want to try to ride upon additional implementations. I don't know, but I've been heard. That, or I have heard, or I've been told, that um, there are some tools out there now supporting MCMC on a, a PMCMC on a routine basis. Specifically, a student of mine, who you'll be hearing from this afternoon, Winchell, tells me that Mathematica now supports PMCMC as a routine matter. I am not aware of widespread support at a performant level elsewhere, but he seems to think 
that the Mathematica implementation is a good one. So that might be a good reference one to, to consider using. Um, these are example outputs from PMCMC in our code base. We sample from the latent state of the system and we sample from MCMC parameters. When you see this kind of, it looks like a hairball. This is over time on the left two graphs, left two columns. This is over time. This is not over time, it's over iteration. This is called a trace plot. It shows a given sampled parameter for different MCMC iterations. And believe it or not, aesthetics aside, you want this sort of up and down behavior where it's exploring this because it suggests it's well mixed. If you see a slow transition like up, it ain't converged. It, this suggests that it's, it has a good prospect of converging. And once you see these enough, you can kind of look at it and say, eh, it's not converged. Or you can say, that plausibly looks, looks converged. Let's try a formal test, like the Heidelberg-Welch test or the Many Walkers test from Gelman. Okay, so these are examples of sampling associated with latent states of the system performed with our PMCMC code base, uh, as led by none other than Li Xiaoyan. Yeah. Um, and, um, and you can see that it gives you pictures out, it's sort of 2D histograms, a little bit like what you get out of any logic um, when you do MCMC, or sorry, particle filtering. Um, it sort of highlights high posterior density regions, and, um, and it can show you these, these latent states as well as measured states. You could use it to show flows, etc. cetera. So um, these are some examples. I'll be showing you after lunch a little uh, case study using PMCMC, which I'd be glad to share with you, and which leverages, social, um, leverages uh, electronically sourced data, many sources, of uh, traditional data to understand opioids, a situation where there's rapidly evolving situation, dynamic parameters, where we need to learn quickly and where we have uh, many, um, uh, many latent states, particularly associated with drug use and drug abuse, which are not easy to get data on. Uh, so we'll be seeing that after lunch, okay? A lot here. I know this is dense. This is, this is cutting edge stuff. There's, to the best of our knowledge, we're the first people, I may be wrong about this, we're certainly the first people worldwide to use this in health, PMCMC with dynamic models. Um, there was some indication when we be began this that we were the first uh, to, we might be the first to publish involving PMCMC with dynamic models in any field with, with simulation models. So, so this is cutting edge stuff. I'm pleased to say it's no longer bleeding edge stuff. I bled, ladies and gentlemen, for a couple of years so that I could teach this stuff without you having to, to go through similar pains. Um, now we have a reliable code base and we have even better students um, to, to, uh, to explore it. Um, uh, the co I'm proud of the code base. I'm prouder of my students who, who bring it to such fruition. Okay, so that's all for, um, for this particular lecture. We'll see a case study after lunch. We will also see some really interesting material on convergent cross mapping, another technique that relates to that picture I showed you earlier in the week that that if you have a coupled complex system, if you see one information on one piece of it, it tells you about the whole system, and we're gonna see how that can be used to assess causal linkage between variables, to assess whether variable A is causally driving variable B in observational data, okay? So that'll be after lunch. We're also gonna have some great stuff on, on um, big data, when it's a necessity, when it's merely a luxury from Winchell, um, we're gonna have some guidance on choosing model uh, method type and uh, uh, walk you through a particle filter model. 
busy afternoon. Looking forward to it. And I suggest you seek sustenance for lunch to prepare. Thank you so much.